looking at a point in Sri Lanka's history where there's going to be, and there has been, quite a lot of protests. Now you're saying excessive force. The government says minimum force was used. The point of tear gas or water cannon is to disperse a crowd if the police thinks they're going to do something violent, right? If there are violent elements in a protest, that doesn't make the whole protest violent. I'm just international feel that there needs to be more international pressure as well on the Sri Lankan authorities to respect human rights laws. It's a shame that the international community has to put this pressure, right? Because it's actually the Sri Lankan government who should be ensuring their own, our own people's rights. We'll never see justice uh, for certain crimes, uh, certain disappearances. Uh, so where is the answer going to come from later on? Criminal investigations, prosecutions shouldn't be reliant on government. Governments come, governments go, but there should be independent institutions that are able to operate without the influence or interference of government. That, okay, these are NGOs with vested interests. There's a lot of money coming in to Amnesty International. We're actually a people's movement of 10 million people around the world, and we're not reliant on government funds. Hello and welcome to another episode of On Fire here on Daily Mirror. I'm Isfaran Ratnam. Human rights in Sri Lanka continues to be uh, something that is drawing international attention. Uh, this has been an issue uh, since uh, the war between the government and the LTTE and even post-war and even today. To discuss the human rights situation in Sri Lanka and why there is so much attention on the country is uh, Tiagi Ruan Patirana, the researcher for Amnesty International. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So Tiagi, uh, based on your research uh, on, on Sri Lanka, uh, how do you see uh, the human rights situation at the moment? I mean, it's not looking good, is it? Like, mm. So we're looking at a point in Sri Lanka's history where there's going to be, and there has been, quite a lot of protests. And I think it will continue uh, despite the government's aggressive crackdown on it. And I think this is also why there's a lot of attention on Sri Lanka. The economic situation isn't great. That means people's right to food, health, nutrition, all of that is affected. But at the same time, the people's freedoms to peacefully assemble, freedom of expression, all those things are really at risk right now. We're seeing uh, just the other day, uh, there was a protest by the NPP on a Sunday and on that, based on the attack and the unnecessary and excessive force used by the police on the protest led to a death of a protester. We're hearing there's another person who's critical at the moment as well. So these are the factors that make Sri Lanka's human rights situation of international concern. But uh, what if someone were to say, okay, this is a one-off incident? that uh, now you're saying excessive force, the government says minimum force was used. Uh, firstly, how would we uh, differentiate excessive force and minimum force? Uh, doesn't the police have a right to use tear gas and water cannons on a protest which they claim was illegal? So this is how it works. So under international law and the really the rules around this go back to the UN basic principles on the use of force. Right? The state is allowed to use force in where it's necessary, where it's proportionate, and where, where they are legally able to do so. But all of that is when it's, you know, looking at that three-part test. Mm -hmm. So here, the protests we saw, the NPP protests, and many protests before that, it's, it's the state not balancing also their own duty to facilitate the right to peaceful assembly, right? For example, protests can happen anywhere, it can be spontaneous, it can be any number of people, as long as it's not, say, inciting violence against another group, right? In that situation, the state is obliged to take action against that. 
or to stop the protest. But the state in general circumstances, it's in international law, it's in the CCPR, it's in Sri Lanka's own constitute to actually enable protests. But what we've seen is as long as it's protest that's critical of government, and this has been the case since I would say March last year, there's been significant crackdown. And when I say excessive and unnecessary force, the state can take action, necessary and proportionate action, where there is a threat to life, right? And what's happening, what we're seeing more and more is that the state's force is more than the damage they try to stop. So that's where proportionality comes in, right? If there's a risk of excessive damage to a property, then the state can take the proportionate action to stop that. But what we're seeing now, especially on in the uh, NPP protests, was that people were, there were a lot of people, hundreds and thousands of people. It was one stretch of road which didn't have a lot of escape routes also. The state, the state, the police was tear gassing on both ends. The point of tear gas or water cannon is to disperse a crowd if the police thinks they're going to do something violent. Right? If there are violent elements in a protest, that doesn't make the whole protest violent. The pro police can take action against just that group. But what we're seeing is they were boxed in and tear gas. That's almost retaliatory. That's not with the intention of getting people to disperse, but with the aim of punishing people. That's completely against international law because the police is actually supposed to facilitate protests. That's why we say it's excessive and unnecessary. So, so ideally, if they had fired from one end and let the people basically flee, that would have been sort of okay. Well, it depends. What was the point? Of, what was the law enforcement objective? Right. Well, they say their objective was to prevent these people from going towards the president's house, presidential secretariat. They felt that that was the route that they were going to take. But see, a, a road, right, is a public good, and it's a Sunday. There's not a lot of vehicular movement either. So there's minimal interruption to anything that the state claims that it was going to disrupt. Even a certain level of disruption is normal in protest. The road as a public good can be used for vehicular movement, it can be used for protest as well. right? So this sort of approach we have of thinking blocking the road is somehow completely wrong, is I think we have to get out of that mentality. The state can restrict movement based on if there's a national security threat, if there's a public health reason, if there's any kind of emergency, that's legitimate. But blocking a road because people are going to protest is actually the opposite of what the state is supposed to do. But if by law, uh, now they are saying that since uh, uh, an election has been declared, a protest march cannot take place. So then if by law, if they say, if, let's say that even the authorities bring in a certain, you know, restriction at that moment saying, you know, okay, no protests uh, for certain reasons, doesn't the country have a right to uh, implement its own domestic laws as opposed to following international rules and regulations? But a domestic law says that people have a right to assemble, right? Peacefully mm -hmm. assemble, right? Just because there's an election, I mean, it's not the day before the election, it's not the day of the election where having thousands of people on the road would have interfered with the people exercising their right to vote. It's none of those things. It's actually the state ensuring that dissent or criticism against them is curtailed. And there's a, you know, sustained effort at that on multiple levels over a period of months. And so now we're beginning to see a pattern that it doesn't tolerate dissent. And this has been the case with successive governments as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, do you feel that the international community, I mean, we see Amnesty International, even Human Rights Watch, uh, raising their concerns, issuing statements after statements on uh, the actions of the authorities. Uh, yet, it still continues. Uh, I mean, does Amnesty International feel that there needs to be more international pressure as well on the Sri Lankan authorities to respect human rights laws? to respect international conventions and to ensure uh, the rights of the public are, are protected. Absolutely, and I <coughs> think um, it's a shame that the international community has to put this pressure, right? Because it's actually the Sri Lankan government who should be ensuring their own, our own people's rights. So for example, the constitution in fundamental rights chapter lays out 
our fundamental rights. So why does it have to be somebody coming from outside, coming and saying, hello, look at your own hu people's human rights. Yeah. People always think of human rights as this sort of, you know, some imposition. In fact, betterment of your own people in your own country should be something that is at the core of any government, right? But I think the international community is looking at it. The diplomatic community is looking at it. The UN Human Rights Council is looking at it, as well as other UN bodies. Right now, the CCPR review is coming up. I know the protests were also raised with the UPR uh, session that took place um, in, uh, in February. So there is a lot of attention. And I think if the government doesn't take into account the fact that you know, Sri Lanka is at, at a position where we are reliant on um, you know, good relations with the international community for funds, for the economic situation, for um, medicines, for fuel. There's a lot at stake right now. And what everyone is saying is look after your people's own human rights, facilitate their right to peaceful assembly. Make sure you don't use unjust reasons to curtail those freedoms. Um, since uh, you mentioned that, you know, uh, the Sri Lankan authorities also need to be mindful of its international relations. Uh, you know, there's also been a call that some uh, countries need to consider sanctions uh, on, on Sri Lanka to ensure that, you know, these uh, issues are addressed, that, you know, just simple statements are not uh, sufficient. I mean, would Amnesty International be pushing for something on those lines as well? Uh, Amnesty International actually very rarely supports sanctions. So, uh, you know, in the past as well, uh, the Sri Lankan authorities had been uh, assuring solutions to, uh, you know, the post-war uh, issues uh, or rather even issues that took place during the final stages of the war. Yet we've not seen those issues also being addressed uh, adequately. There are still a lot of pending uh, uh, cases. Uh, how does Amnesty International see this? I mean, what are you uh, pushing for on that end? So at the UN Human Rights Council, we've been speaking about a new resolution and we've got a new resolution recently that's looking at Sri Lanka's human rights situation in total, not just war related issues, because there's a lot of new issues that have come up since. I mean, next year, if you think about it, it's been 15 years since the end of the war, next May. And there are people, the mothers of the disappeared, for six years straight, they've been protesting, asking for truth and justice there have been no remedies for them, right? If you think about it, because if you think about your own loved one who's gone missing and you have that slightest hope or inclination that they could be in some kind of detention center that you just haven't had access to, you would do everything in your power to make sure you get those answers. So that's what really the struggle has been about. And the land issues as well, people are still struggling to get their own lands back because during the course of the war, they, dis they were displaced from place to place and then they were in camps. And after that, years later, they came back and they found these places occupied by the military. So what compensation have they got? Why can't they have any kind of say in the matter? Because some of these land is important to them because ancestral land, the fact that it could be close with close access to the sea routes. So there are, because these land also revolve around, like their livelihoods revolve around the land. So these are kind of like the core issues that remain unaddressed, right? And if you think about it, the domestic responses, the Office on Missing Persons has now been operational for at least five years. Uh, because I think 2018, Feb, is when they actually started work. And to this day, their main mandate or main um, job, essentially, is to seek and give answers about what happened to missing people. Figure out how they went missing, the circumstances in which that happened. But to date, not one case has been found. So the struggles and the frustrations are very real. I mean, you just have to put yourself in those, the mother's shoes to understand why they're still at it. But it seems that uh, successive governments are prioritizing other areas as opposed to issues on missing persons, uh, issues related to the war. Almost like, you know, they don't want uh, attention on those issues. They don't want the spotlight uh, on those issues. Uh, isn't there a bigger role that, you know, um, Sri Lanka's neighbors can play, uh, the international community as a whole can play to ensure that, uh, you know, justice is given for these people who are seeking justice. So I think the, the problem here is that at the end of the day, I'm not sure that any international organization or international body can come and give answers to the mothers saying this is actually what happened to your disappeared 
husband, disappeared son, right? They say that they were last seen in this camp. All of that information is something that the state holds. It could be the military, it could be the camps, whoever who are running the camps, so and whoever who's running detention centers. So at the end of the day, that truth and that information thereafter is is something within the government's control. And there are like hundreds of cases in 2009, and mothers are still uh, going to quote about it also, where people were surrendered to the army, right? The army announced in loudspeakers saying that even if you were a combatant for one day, please come and disclose that information. We'll screen you and then we'll let you go. Or like they'll be put into camps. Upon that assurance, mothers, uh, there, there could have been actual LTT combatants, there could have been people that the LTT forced to take up arms at the end of the war because they were desperate. Mothers made their kids, their husbands disclose this, saying army is saying this, this is a responsible body, let's disclose this because otherwise what if they find out later, right? So it's that guilt that the mothers now carry, that they made their sons go and disclose this fact and they were taken away in buses, never to be seen again. How can you live with yourself, right? So the accountability, the answers and the justice really lies with the government. That's why I think they don't want a spotlight on it, not just because it's a sticky issue, it's because it's their own people who are responsible for what happened. But then if they are going to uh, protect these individuals as well, the military commanders who have that information, some of the other individuals, and we see some of them now being given, you know, positions in the government as state ministers, uh, various other heads of authorities. Uh, if these people are being protected, where is the justice going to come from then? This is why there has to be a genuine commitment from all sides. It can be, and, and you know, the disappearances issue is one where there are multiple parties involved, right? The end of the war is one thing, but also we can go back to the 80s, yeah. the JBP insurrection. There are hundreds of mothers, even in the South, who have gone through a similar fate. Some of them have moved on because those cases are more than 30 years old now. But there are others who feel like after 20 years, I heard somebody in that village, uh, a man was released from detention and came home 20 years after. And that is giving them hope, right? It's like if there's a chance that can happen to that family, it could happen to mine. So it's, it's not a ma matter of just a blame game about which government did what, but really looking at the human issue, trying to empathize that at the end of the day, these are people. If, they are, if, they, if these people, if there were combatants, if there were criminals involved, no one is saying not to hold them to account. The government is actually obliged under international law to take criminal actions against them in a fair trial process. Right? What's happened now is that these people have literally sort of disappeared, right? They're not to be found. And that's taking them outside the protections of the law. If there's somebody wrong, hold them to account in a court of law and then let them serve their time and come out. That should be the process. But then uh, we've also seen that, you know, in the past, like for example, uh, in 2015, the government that was there at that time, uh, ensure, uh, assure justice for certain incidents, the murder of La Santa Vikramutunga, the Trinko case and so on. Uh, and they started investigating, started uh, prosecuting certain people as well, but then it never went far. Uh, and then you see these very individuals later being protected as well. Uh, and one would assume that if there is another government, a change in government later on as well, that they would do the same. They would say, yes, we will, we will investigate these incidents, but then just to remain in power, just to have the support of uh, uh, the majority, uh, it feels like, you know, that they will protect those people as well. So it looks like that this, this thing is just going to drag and drag, that we will never see justice uh, for certain crimes, uh, certain disappearances. Uh, so where is the answer going to come from later on? I think the straight answer to your question is that Criminal investigations, prosecutions shouldn't be reliant on government. Governments come, governments go, but there should be independent institutions that are able to operate without the influence or interference of government. Right? If we had an independent... But that is also an issue now. 
these independent institutions are also being pressurized by the government. That's the thing, I mean, <laughs> in this current context, <laughs> yeah. yes. I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, we have to ensure that amendments to the constitutions to bring in, like, more protections and more independence to independent institutions like Human Rights Commission, National Police Commission, Elections Commission. All of those things are necessary. And at the same time, the CID, for example, like, after 2015, what did we see? There was some progress in a few cases, right? Some cases were just downright overturned, right? Sunil Ratnayaka got a pardon. Uh, we can look at the Joseph Pairaj Singham case. People were acquitted. Uh, Lasantha Vikramatunga case, not going anywhere. Prageet Teknaligoda's case has moved a little bit, but now has really lost speed a little bit. But, and then that's all happening in a context where the former CID director was hauled, uh, there were trumped up charges brought against him. There was a presidential commission of inquiry on political victimization that was making recommendations to either promote people or drop charges against military officials who were implicated in trials. So that's the kind of reversal of justice or justice attempts that we've seen, right? And so I think the real answer is really to step back and ensure that our independent systems like the criminal investigations, the prosecutor's office, Th that's a huge problem right now, right? The Attorney General's office plays a dual role. It plays the function of the state's or the government's legal advisor, but at the same time is the body that's supposed to prosecute against criminal acts take, uh, done by state officials. So that's a huge conflict of interest, right? You need a specific body that's looking at independent prosecutions that's not li linked to the state, giving advice, legal advice to the government. Other countries have this. And we don't have this, and that's why there's so much influence in the prosecutions. Why is uh, Amnesty International having so much focus uh, on Sri Lanka? Uh, you know, the allegation that always comes up is that, okay, these are NGOs with vested interests. There's a lot of money coming in to Amnesty International. So they are continuing to uh, push for the human rights, uh, push on the human rights issue, because if not, there's no, there won't be funding coming in. I'm smiling because I love that you asked this yeah. question. Um, Amnesty International is actually very different to the other uh, international organizations because we are not an NGO in the normal sense. We're actually a people's movement of 10 million people around the world and we're not reliant on government funding. We're funded solely by membership. So meaning anyone in the world, like when I used to live in the UK, I used to be a member giving one pound a month for Amnesty's work because I believed in the work. So similarly, there are people around the world who fund the work who don't get to say which, what to work on, for example. So it's really a people's movement. That's what makes us different from other organizations who are reliant on government funding. So we are not. Um, and I think the reason why we are so interested in Sri Lanka is because, you know, since the 80s, Amnesty has been looking at Sri Lanka, right? We were actually here looking at enforced disappearances even back then. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting if you go back, like, this is even before the time I was born, people, Amnesty was still releasing press releases back then. Um, and, and, it, and it's interesting, I think some of my predecessors tell me stories of how Mahindra Rajapaksha back in the day used to come to the Amnesty office in London as well. Okay. So there has been a strong relationship with Sri Lanka for a very long time and now our South Asia office is based in Colombo. Um, and so we decide what kind of work we do and what kind of human rights violations are happening, is it something that's relevant to us? And I think there is a lot of interest and the struggles and the reasons are real. And we're on the ground and we're able to see that on a daily basis and that's why our interest is in Sri Lanka. Um, comparatively, uh, I mean, since you're working on South Asia, uh, how do you see the situation in other countries like India, let's say India, Pakistan uh, and Sri Lanka? I mean, can you compare those countries? Do you see more uh, attention given to protecting human rights in certain countries as opposed to others in South Asia? Um, I think we'll be comparing apples and oranges. I mean, from our office, we look at India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, um, even the Maldives. Uh, but I think the kind of issues we deal with, are, you know, the number of people also is very different, right? Sri Lanka is 20 million, like India is like so many times that, Pakistan so many times that. I mean, comparatively, maybe with the exception of Maldives, we have a very small population. But the issues we deal with, there are some common co cross-cutting themes, like there's a shrinking civic space and attack on dissent happening in Bangladesh, Pakistan, India as well. 
Um, but I think our issues are very different also because we're coming out of a post-war context, right? Uh, I think Afghanistan has a little bit of similarities, but then two years ago since uh, Kabul fell and now the Taliban is in power, uh, I think even that situation has changed quite a bit, that it's really not that easy to uh, compare. You mentioned about the Human Rights Council. Uh, um, finally, like, you know, what would Amnesty International be expecting from the Human Rights Council when Sri Lanka is taken up later on again, in, I guess in June and September, is it? Yeah, I would expect the High Commissioner's Office to come out with a very strong statement. Um, let's see in the coming months what the protests are going to be like, what the crackdown is going to be like, because that's really an opportunity, the only opportunity actually, for Sri Lanka's human rights situation to be discussed in an international forum. So let's see what the High Commissioner says, because by then, I'm guessing there would be more protests if elections are postponed even further. There's a lot of people are being squeezed, right? The electricity tariff hike, the fact that inflation is still quite high, so the cost of living is high. So all those struggles will bring people to the streets. But at the same time, there's not enough support being given to the people to be able to bear through this economic crisis. We see ad hoc community kitchens and things like that, but I think we're, we're at a time where we need to be focusing on universal um, um, support, welfare support, right? Because it's very difficult for people right now. And, and the economic rights aspect of um, Sri Lanka is something that we're, we're starting to look more yeah. and more into as well. Yeah, there's, there's called for an investigation on economic crimes as well. Is that something that even Amnesty International is also pushing for? Uh, yes, a little bit, but we're not involved so much. It's something that we support the High Commissioner's Office uh, to be pushing for, yes. Right, yeah, we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Tiagi, for joining us on the program. No today. problem. Thanks for having me. And that's all the time we have for you for On Fire for this week. Uh, Till next time, stay safe.